Hey everyone, I'm the Canadian Lad, and today I watched the final episode of Moon Knight at point two Fabic Speed and found some amazing, amazing details. Now, I'm gonna try to keep this video tight, but having said that, it is a full breakdown plus my point two Fabic Speed series. So I will go scene by scene and try to explain everything. And if I spot an easter egg or a hidden detail along the way, I'll talk about it too. So without wasting any time, let's begin. During the previously on segment, we see the sarcophagus that Mark and Steven ignored in episode 4. Then episode 5 went by and no mentions of Jake Lockley. But this episode started by showing us a third tomb. So right off the bat I could tell they are officially gonna reveal the third personality, Jake Lockley. Now during Marvel's intro, we get yet another interesting soundtrack. The song is called The End by Earl Grant. And it has lyrics like at the end of a story you'll find it's all been told. And it has a story without any end. Now this song pretty much reflects the whole series. Because if you watch the entire series, series again, you'll find that everything perfectly slots into place, and you realize some of the mysteries were right in front of your eyes the whole time. And therefore the line in the song, at the end of a story you'll find it's all been told. And the way this episode ended, leaving us wanting more of Jake Lockley, leaving us with more questions than answers, it really had no ending. And therefore the line, it has a story without any end. I love the soundtracks of the series, job well done. We then get back to the real world, where Mark Spector is shot dead by Harrow. And Harrow of course takes the Ushapti of Amit from Mark's body. But notice what Harrow says here. Mark Spector. Stephen Grant. Whoever else might be in there. He clearly knew that Mark possessed way more personalities than he met. Harrow met Steven and Mark, but when he was trying to measure Mark's scales, he definitely felt more than two personalities inside him. Now notice the statue of a bird behind Harrow. This is a statue of Ibis. Now Ibis is a symbol of balance, and it makes sense that such a symbol would appear behind Harrow as he's incredibly focused on balancing the scale of mankind. Layla then cries over the dead body of Mark. I mean, you gotta feel for her. She lost her father in the same cause, and now she lost a man who she fell in love with twice. She lets go of Mark's body and takes the scarab with her, and she sneaks in with the team of Harrow. Harrow and his disciples then get stopped at a checkpoint, and there he just outright kills all of them by judging their soul, except for this one soldier whose scales remain balanced. Now while Harrow's team moves the body out of the way, Tawaret, oh I can't say her name, this hippo goddess talks to Layla through the dead bodies of these soldiers. She tells Layla to find the Ushapti of Khonshu, as Khonshu is the only one who can help Mark heal from these gunshots and fight Amit. Cut to the Chamber of Gods, which we previously saw in episode 3, and here we learn that all the other gods are basically a bunch of idiots and they're not in on it with Harrow. Now I understand it's all science fiction over here, but look at this actress wearing heels, watching her steps as she comes down the stairs. I understand if you take a glance once, but she kept looking down the entire time. All the other actors were essentially focused on Harrow and only Harrow, but this particular actor didn't do the job convincingly. I'm sorry I had to point this out, I just find it funny that an avatar of God is walking down the stairs carefully cause she's wearing heels. The costume department should have taken care of this, because mistakes like this tend to take away the authenticity of a story. Anyway, Harrow then releases Amit from her banishment, and the first person who gets judged is also Harrow. But she doesn't kill him because he's the one who released her from prison. This immediately shows Amit's hypocrisy, and how unhinged she has become. Now the look of Amit has been taken directly from ancient Egyptian mythology. The head of a crocodile, the front legs of a lion, and the back of a hippo. And on the other hand, Layla finds the Ushapti of Khonshu, and breaks it to release him. Now as soon as Khonshu gets freed, he senses that Mark Spector is dead, so he asks Layla to be his avatar. Even talks in a way that would mend her heart. You need a plan, little bug. But Layla refuses, so Khonshu leaves her alone and goes face to face with Amit. Now in my breakdown of episode 3, I told you that Khonshu doesn't really cast any shadow on the ground. This remained true even in this episode in all the scenes, except for when he's inside the Chamber of Gods. That's the only time Khonshu casts any type of shadow on the walls or surface around him, indicating this chamber, or the Overvoid as it's called in the comics, makes this god somewhat more powerful and alive. This chamber is our most powerful place. Cut to the duet where Mark sacrifices himself because he does not want eternal peace in exchange for Steven's life. This shows how far Mark has come in his life. He lived alone without his brother once, for which he still believes he's guilty, and that's why he doesn't want to make the same mistake twice. He doesn't want to survive at the cost of a loved one, so he gets frozen with sand just like Steven. But after seeing this, Osiris decides to open his gate and give a second chance to both Mark and Steven. And if you notice, Mark gave his heart to Steven just before he got frozen, in hopes that it would thaw 
draw Steven out. But this one heart ended up pumping life in both of them. Meaning, Mark and Steven are now powered by only one heart even in the afterlife. They both finally became two sides of the same coin, as opposed to being two separate coins. Then enters this sweet little hippo who protects them from this massive sandstorm using the ship. And then they both successfully cross the gate, coming back to life in the real world. Now after a rewatch of the whole series at one go, I just realized the whole series was already foreshadowed through different artifacts in Steven's fish tank. For example, this pyramid represents the Pyramid of Giza. This boat represents the boat we see in the afterlife. This castle building indicates Conscious Temple and of course the Gates of Osiris. I love it when creators leave clues throughout a show that all start to make sense as the story unfolds. Now after Mark comes back to life in the real world, he starts bleeding from these two gunshots. He was gonna die again anyway, as this hippo said, Even if I could send you back up there, You'd just be returning to a body with a bullet in it. You wouldn't be able to heal. Now Khonshu, who's in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Amit, senses Mark's existence immediately. So Khonshu flies away to make Mark his avatar once again, therefore saving Mark's life yet another time, which does happen in the comics quite frequently as well. And as soon as Khonshu bestows his powers upon Mark, the bullets come out of his body and he stops bleeding from his face, giving us this epic scene where Mark Spectre becomes Moon Knight again. Mark and Steven then negotiate with Khonshu that if they help Khonshu defeat Amit, Khonshu will have to set them free. Kanchu of course agrees because, well, because of the post credit scene. And if you think about it, the fact that Kanchu kept Mark and Steven in the dark about Jake is actually foreshadowed in this scene. Notice what Kanchu said to Steven when he promised he will release them after the mission is done. I will release you both. You have my word. He specifically says, I will release you both. Doesn't say, I'll release you or I'll release you all. So Kanchu wasn't lying. He did release them both, but kept Jake as his avatar, which Jake happily accepted. Layla then lets Tara Red, uh, this hippo, take over. And we get our official Scarlet Scarab in the MCU, something director Mohamed Diab has been hinting at since the very beginning. And I just love the way she looks. I know some people are complaining about the CGI here, but to me, it's perfectly fine. Now, in the comics, Abdul Fowl goes by the name Scarlet Scarab and is one of Marvel's first Egyptian heroes, so the MCU has slightly changed it and gave his daughter the mantle instead, which I absolutely love. I do have issues with the way they keep changing male characters to female, but this one really worked. Mei Kalamawi, the actor who plays Layla, did a fantastic job. And if you look closely, you can see that Layla's outfit features a scarab, implying the scarab that she took from Mark at the beginning of the episode got incorporated in her suit as well. Harold then gets on top of the pyramid, and with his newly gained powers, he's now able to judge and execute an entire area with his disciples. And here we get a sneaky little cameo from director Mohamed Diab himself. I noticed him the first time around, but then I googled it just to make sure. Lad became a villain in his own show, eh? Now Amit actually consumes all these souls and gets even more powerful, which again shows a hidden agenda. Her idea is not to get rid of evil, it's to rule a world where she's the most powerful. Notice how her hair, which looks like the tail of a croc, pushes this car and this truck as she keeps growing bigger. Then comes this epic climactic battle, where for the first time we see a hero fighting a villain, and at the same time the sources of their power are fighting as well. Now I found quite a lot of hidden details during this fight that are really hard to catch at a regular speed. So this is the part where I want all your attention. Notice Harrow gets a hold of Mark's cape and was almost choking him with it. And that's when Mark decides to let Steven in who does not have a cape in his suit. But Steven cannot fly properly as he lacks a cape. So he then quickly lets Mark in in order to better maneuver in the air. This is the first fight where neither Mark or Steven are fighting one another for control. They both are working together as a team and it is clearly visible. Layla then saves Mark from Harrow's blast, and even deflects one using her winged shields. Now let me take a few seconds to admire Layla's character arc here. She didn't just become a good fighter after receiving godly powers. She was already great in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and most importantly, she's a fighter who has no fear. So with the Tao, ta for fuck's sake, so with Tower Red's power, she's now even stronger. This is how true female superheroes look when done correctly. So kudos to the whole Moon Knight team for that. Now notice how Mark is relieved and happy to see Layla alive. Oh, baby. Oh, God. I think I but Steven compliments her after seeing her in the costume. Wow, you look amazing. What are you wearing? So it's established once again, Steven is Mark's alter ego who is better at communicating his feelings. As we learned in episode 3, this is something Mark isn't good at. That's not really what I do, is it? I've never really been able to just talk about everything. Mark will tell you whether he's happy or angry, but Steven will go into details and tell you why. Or Mark will tell you you're beautiful, but Steven will tell you why you're beautiful. I love the action choreography in this episode. The way Steven fights with his batons and dodges Harrow's blast are so satisfying to see, especially after knowing how much Steven had to struggle to realize he has all these skills. And I love how Steven throws his baton, but when it comes back, Mark is the one catching it. And at one point, Harrow throws Steven in an alley, but we see Mark coming back using his grappling hook. The action choreography 
Fighter Fair really did justice to Moon Knight's fighting styles. No complaints on that. Now notice an incredible attention to detail here. When Mark comes flying towards Harrow, Mark can be seen in his Moon Knight outfit in the mirrors of the background. Well, this entire scene could be CGI. Or maybe a stun double was really coming in with a flying kick, but probably had wires attached to his body. Whatever it is, the scene surely didn't look like this when filming. So kudos to the VFX team for making sure the mirrors reflect what's happening in the real world. Now at the end, Mark is pinned down by Harrow, but he blacks out. Now this is obviously Jake Lockley, who took over and killed everybody. Well, everyone except for Harrow, who he was about to kill as well, but then Mark came back to his senses. So just as I said in my episode 3 breakdown, the transition between Mark and Steven is very smooth and seamless. They can literally switch places mid-conversation or mid-fight. But whenever a third personality intervenes, aka Jake Lockley, Mark suffers a mini-seizure. I'm so happy my theory turned out to be right, and I'm pretty sure many of you got this detail by your own as well. Now notice, before Jake Lockley took over, the surroundings were not that much damage. The lights were on in this door, and even some people were inside. But after the blackout, there are flames, more debris on the road, and this store is literally shattered, indicating Jake Lockley has no limits. He truly represents what Mark fears he is, a ruthless killer. If Steven is the result of Mark's guilt, Jake is the result of Mark's vengeance. He would get the job done when Mark or Steven's moral compass comes in the way. And keep in mind, Layla saw it all with her own eyes what Jake did. So in season 2, I'm pretty sure Layla will ask Mark, what came over you that night? How did you become I'm so brutal all of a sudden, and why the hell were you shouting in Spanish? Anyway, then they capture Amit in Hera's body, and Khonshu tells Mark to kill him, but Mark couldn't make himself do it. Khonshu then releases Mark from his possession, or so we are made to believe, and then he wakes up in his illusion where he sees Dr. Harrow leaving a trail of bloody footprints as he walks. This calls back to the very first scene of the first episode, where Arthur Harrow filled his sandals with broken glass. Now this clarifies one thing, and that is this office room is not a part of the hospital where Mark and Steven try to balance their scale. That hospital, which is a realm of Duat, is very real. The reason Mark and Steven saw it as the hospital was because of their own mental state. This hippo actually explained it better than me. Because the Duat's true nature is impossible for the human mind to comprehend, right. you may perceive this realm as something more easily recognizable to you. A psych ward's a first for me, but... But this office where Mark sees Dr. Harrow isn't real. This is only in his imagination, or at least that's what I believe. And that's why Dr. Harrow was bleeding from his feet now that Mark and Steven both know who he truly is. You could see the way Dr. Harrow gets up. His hand gestures clearly indicate he's in agony and pain as he walks around. And notice one detail that I didn't see anyone spotting yet. Well, I did discover a lot of details that he won't find anywhere else, but this one's special. Notice the outsole at the bottom part of Dr. Harrow's shoes here. It has the same scale symbol that he has in his right arm in the real world. They showed it for less than a second, so you really have to see it in slow-mo or pause it to see it. Steven then says, hey, this guy is. Mark then wakes up at Steven's flat and asks if Steven is there, to which Steven replies, can't believe that worked. But then Mark takes over and tries to get up from the bed. Now, because this was Mark getting up from Steven's bed, he didn't check on the ankle restraint that Steven uses to tie himself to bed. If it was Steven though, he would have remembered to check on his leg first, which he always does. Now notice, Steven not only strapped himself to the bed, put sand on the floor, but he also duct taped the door using the same blue tape as we've seen in episode 1. Now you may ask, why did Steven tie himself up in the bed and why would Mark allow it in the first place if they have come to terms with their multiple personalities? Well, the answer to that is what will lead us to season 2, or hopefully a movie, because they both are vaguely aware that there might be another personality lurking in the background. And that's why he still ties himself up every night before going to sleep. And before the episode ends, we can again see Steven's fish tank, which now has two goldfish instead of one, representing how Mark and Steven have finally found balance in their lives. Now onto the post credit scene, it opens by showing us this rubber duck dressed as a doctor. Now the first time we saw this rubber duck was in Mark's imagination just underneath the TV. Then we see Harrow as a mental patient, who imagines his coffee as sand. Now the only reason I can think of is, in his fascination with finding Amit's tomb, he spent so much time in the desert that all he ever thinks about is sand. We can also spot the scale tattoo on his right arm, indicating this is the same real Harrow we've seen so far. Then comes Jake Lockley, who woos the nurse into letting him take Harrow outside. This solves yet another mystery in the series. In episode 1, we learn that Steven has a date with one of his colleagues. 
colleagues, but he never remembers asking her out. And we know that Mark has remained pretty loyal to his wife Layla throughout, so it has to be Jake Lockley who asked her out on that date that none of them can remember. Now we can spot a QR code on this poster, and if we scan the code, it'll take us to another free Moon Knight comic, called Moon Knight X of Evil number 1 from 2019, which features Moon Knight fighting Kang the Conqueror. So could this be Marvel planting a seed for the future? Now, of course Kang already appeared in the MCU in Loki, and he will appear again in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Now as Harry is getting wheeled outside, you can see that the hospital he's staying in is called Sankovich Psychiatric Hospital, which is a nod to comic book artist Bill Sankovich, who gave the first Moon Knight comic series its signature look. Now another detail that shows all of this are happening in the real world is Harrow's sandals. These are the same pair of shoes that he wears in the other episodes. And I like how Jake just needlessly kicks the wheelchair out of pure anger, establishing we're about to see Mark Spector being unleashed. Then we see Conchu donning a formal suit, probably inspired by Steven's Mr. Knight costume. And damn does it look good, eh? They managed to make a CGI character look this good in a formal suit. Conchu then reveals to Harrow that he still has an avatar in the form of Jake Lockley. Meet my friend, Jake Lockley. This entire scene was just badass. Jake then proceeds to kill Harrow with a silenced gun. That too with a smile on his face. And notice he doesn't even blink while shooting. I mean it's baffling just how inhuman he is compared to Mark or Steven. And I guess this is how season 2 can begin. Mark and Steven might see on the news that Moon Knight is still actively killing people. And he will go on an investigation against Khonshu to figure out who his new avatar is. Only to find out it's him again. His third personality aka Jake Lockley. Now Jake driving a limo is a subtle nod to the comics. In the comics, Jake Lockley is a cab driver. Which is a skill that comes in very handy when he's Moon Knight. Since he knows every street of New York so well, and the license plate on the limo says SPKTR or Spectre. And in the comics, Stephen Grant is indeed a millionaire who has a limo. So I guess we'll have to wait to see what's the connection there. And that's it. This would be my breakdown of Moon Knight episode 6 at pointy fabric speed. I hope I was able to give you lads some new details you didn't catch before. If I did, then please give me a thumbs up, grab the subscribe button, and turn notifications on. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter to get updates about my videos. Till then, I'll see you lads in the next one. Show you.